Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this first virtual panel for the Louisville Downtown Strategy. Uh, I'm Rebecca Fleischaker. I'm Executive Director of Louisville Downtown Partnership, and um, this is our first of, I hope, three or four expert panels slash community conversations that we'll be having uh, for what uh, national experts see uh, trending in the United States, um, really vis-a-vis -vis what we want to see in Louisville. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring that throughout the discussion and we will address those at the end. Um, but now I'm going to turn it over to Barry Alberts, uh, our consultant that we're working with, with City Visions Associates to kick off and moderate our panel. Barry. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, well, welcome everybody to the first in a series of community conversations as part of the current Downtown Louisville Development Strategy downtown after the pandemic, a new paradigm. And thanks for all of you for joining in. We all know that the impact that the pandemic has had and continues to have on downtowns, not just here in Louisville, but across the nation. While some of the most severe impacts may have lessened to some extent, we know that things will not be the same as they were and that downtowns that wish to remain active, vibrant, and economically healthy will need to recognize these changes and adapt to them which require new ways of thinking about their look, their feel, their mix of uses, and their role in the community. While we struggle to figure out how downtown must respond, we can also recognize that there are new opportunities that this para paradigm can bring to the forefront. There's lots of discussions occurring from experts across the country in what this new paradigm will look like and how to respond. And anyone who says they know exactly what will happen permanently should be looked at with suspicion. But across the country, we're seeing how cities are responding, and we thought it useful to begin with an overview, a snapshot, if you will, of what's being tried and what early results are beginning to be seen, and advice as to what we should be thinking about as we plan for downtown Louisville's next decade. While we'll touch upon downtown Louisville, our focus today really is more of a national perspective. We are extremely fortunate that we've been able to assemble a remarkable panel of nationally renowned urbanists to kick off this series and provide an overview of the state of downtowns, addressing both the challenges that we all face, as well as new opportunities that have arisen in response to these changing conditions. We've asked each of our panelists to provide some opening comments and observations <coughs> Then we'll open it up for discussion among them and questions from our audience, which can be submitted through the chat button on your screen. So let me first introduce our panelists. First will be David Downey. David is the president and chief executive officer of the International Downtown Association, the leading professional organization for those involved with the economic health and well-being of downtown centers. As CEO, David is responsible for the overall strategic positioning of IDA as a champion of mixed use urban communities. Together with a dedicated team, team of member leaders and professional staff, IDA empowers district management professionals with knowledge, research, and public policies for creating prosperous centers, commercial neighborhoods, and livable urban places. IDA has been very helpful to us here in Louisville through the years, both through its interaction with the LDP and the downtown management district. Prior to joining IDA, David served as the Managing Director for the American Institute of Architects Urban Design Center and as Executive Director for the Michigan Chapter of the American Planning Association. Following David will be Mallory Batches. Mallory serves as the President of the Congress of the New Urbanism. The Congress, of, of the New Urban, Congress for New Urbanism, CNU as it's known, is a member-based member nonprofit organization championing the better design of cities and towns to improve lives and strengthen communities for all. For over 30 years, it has been the primary organization that gathers the broad spectrum of practitioners and advocates working on reforming city building, driving change in communities across the nation and beyond. CNU serves as a key knowledge aggregator for its members. It collects, prioritizes, and disseminates best practices in urban policy and design, and assists its members in enacting meaningful change in these communities. Celebrated for her previous practice as an urban designer, Mallory brings 25 years of international work in urban planning, 
community and community development, as well as a wealth of experience in nonprofit leadership, having served as a staff member and advisor uh, on governing boards of organizations making an impact of an impact through urban change. Some of you may have met Mallory when Louisville was fortunate to host the CNU's annual Congress in 2019, where I had the honor of serving as the co-chair of the host committee. Many of those listening today probably were able to attend those sessions and thus were able to experience how significant CNU is to cities and downtowns across the country. We're pleased to welcome her back today, at least virtually, for today's session. Laurie Volk is a principal of Zimmerman Volk Associates of Clinton, New Jersey. Zimmerman mm -hmm. Volk Associates is nationally recognized as a leading practitioner in the analysis of the housing component of urban redevelopment, compact and sustainable development, mixed income and mixed use redevelopment, and traditional neighborhood development. Since 1988, ZVA has completed more than 650 residential market studies. The firm's extensive urban analysis includes more than 120 studies focused on downtowns and over 125 focused on mixed income housing redevelopment and infill development. Laurie Volk and Todd Zimmerman, the company's founders, were the recipients of the 2015 Seaside Prize, which is presented annually to an individual or organization that has made significant contributions to the quality and character of communities. Laurie has worked in Louisville before, and we're pleased that she's currently working with us on the Louisville downtown strategy. James Lima is the president of the real estate and economic advisory firm, James Lima Planning and Development, which helps lead planning and implementation of transformative downtown investments and other urban revitalization projects throughout North America. Since 2011, the firm has guided and advised on high impact placemaking initiatives ranging from individual buildings and public spaces to district citywide and regional strategies. The firm is known for its ability to see and demonstrate value in innovative approaches that align the interests of communities, businesses, developers, governments, and arts and cultural institutions. James' work in center cities spans four decades and has focused on equitable economic development, affordable housing production, and unlocking real estate and economic value through great placemaking. James is the co-author with the Urban Land Institute of The Case for Open Space, Why the Real Estate Industry Should Invest in Parks and Open Space, and the publication Placemaking as an Economic Engine for All. Previously, James served as the New York Affordable Housing and Economic Development Official, and then was appointed by then New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg as founding president of Governor's Island in New York Harbor. We welcome all of you. We appreciate you taking your time to help us today. And let's start off with David Downey. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Rebecca, for inviting me. Um, look forward, looking forward to today's presentation and uh, discussion. Thought I would do a little bit of stage setting for the entire panel and share what the uh, International Downtown Association and its members are discussing. Uh, really, as we are all trying to sort out what is the, what the future of our cities look like. I think the first is to recognize that you know, we perceive this as really recognizing that there were four different disruptions that all transpired at the same time or in subsequent um, periods of time. Certainly, I think we're all familiar with the global health crisis as the first. But then you know, we've realized that the stay in home directives that shut down our city centers differed around the country. Um, and there is now a direct correlation between those downtowns um, they were shut down for the longest period of time, say 90 days plus, and their recovery being much slower to those downtowns, which may have only been shut down for uh, you know, less than 30 days. Um, we can see a direct correlation between the shutdown uh, duration and the recovery of these urban centers. And often, you know, many of us see these in a variety of ways. Storefront closures were clearly one of the uh, key items and vacancies that continue throughout uh, time. We of course had a third uh, disruption with the protests that occurred around uh, current policing strategies. It unfortunately included vandalism and looting, and we are now still suffering in many instances from loss in confidence of city centers um, and, and the security and the restoration of safety in our urban centers. This is being felt around the nation. 
And then the fourth disruption really is um, what we're even using today, which is the fact that technology has changed the way in which work is being done. There is an alternative to the traditional uh, solely working in office experience. And like many things, the pandemic accelerated this. So recognizing that there are um, you know, a multitude of issues that are addressed, I think one that everyone's continuing to work towards and understand is what is the impact of this work from home? Because especially in downtowns where you are a um, uh, largely a, a hub of office environment, that has had the, the greatest impact. And there's great work being done, Stanford, Chicago, an item that is working through this on a regular basis. The general highlights that, that I take from their work on an ongoing basis is that, yes, the, the nature of work will change. Um, we may never be 100% back in office, but also to, you know, even if it's a 60% full full time in office or near full time or 70%, the message here is that I think we simply need to work with our local employers, work with our, our workforce, begin to understand what the, what the prospects look like, but rather than uh, only focusing on getting everyone back, understanding what are the opportunities that this will lend us moving forward as we redevelop and grow our urban centers. We also know, of course, that the different types of employment um, have varying um, uh, opportunities to work from home. And so when we start to think about our business mix and of course, hospitality, food services, retail trade, you know, these are not work from home conditions. And so when we look at our workforce, we will begin to better understand, you know, which are those types of jobs and, and, uh, and organizations that will, uh, be able to work from home, perhaps completely remotely if I'm an information uh, finance tech worker with headquarters on the west coast of the country, why might I want to be in a place like Louisville uh, where I can uh, certainly work remotely, uh, but then look to really enjoy uh, the amenities and the opportunities of a, a mid-sized wonderful place like Louisville. So we're beginning to understand that the work from home component differs for all different types of work. And then also, too, there's a significant difference between, you know, whether it's a major city, which is the top line, or the, the middle line, which there's a much smaller impact of the, the work from home trend uh, that's already happening and continuing. So Louisville, of course, would be in that, you know, middle line where the percent of work from home is less than those areas where your commutes are so significant in major cities. This should be viewed as an opportunity for a place like Louisville. So in very large scale, thinking in terms of, you know, guidelines that we're recommending to our members is, you know, first and foremost, you know, the patterns of remote work are uneven across all of our cities. And while, you know, a lot of national stories try, try and uh, predict the future, first and foremost, everyone needs to truly understand your own downtown economy, your own downtown assets, your own uh, opportunities. Um, let's not fall to the trappings of just national uh, media. Um, as noted, the, the recovery uh, is directly related to uh, both the, the amount of days in the shutdown, but also to the length of commute. Again, this really provides an opportunity for uh, mid-tier cities and smaller scale towns that have that live-work relationship uh, in a much, much more dense, dense environment. We recognize that leadership matters. You know, these are not immutable trends. So encouraging employers to engage employees and really helping to define that new normal is an ongoing work, not only of downtown organizations, but civic leadership, business leadership, um, you know, political leadership, understanding that we are in a new era and what can we begin to do to broker, broker um, new conversations that really help to move us uh, through this uh, process of rebuilding. You know, many of our downtown organizations uh, continue to play a key role and did throughout the pandemic and really providing services um, on the ground in the public realm has always been, um, you know, a strength of the organization and the downtown executives really beginning to take uh, roles as uh, Rebecca is today and the organization is today to think about how do we begin to shape these trends and really look at our downtown land use which ultimately is our kind of fifth uh, realization, no matter where you're coming from, single use central business districts uh, did not fare well through the pandemic. Uh, those areas that were most successful uh, would be the, the likes of a uh, midtown Atlanta immediately adjacent to downtown Atlanta. 
that already had a mix mix of uses, strong residential base. You know, these are the uh, sorts of um, strategies that are being deployed across the country in many downtowns. Um, all, of course, looking at their unique circumstances, but really advocating for more diverse downtown land uses, which ultimately will make it more competitive and more sustainable. In the near term. Uh, in the near term, um, we must address the safety, security, the clean and green of our cities. And we're seeing a whole host of partnerships evolve, whether you're Hollywood, California, or even um, downtown Winnipeg in Canada. And this is that direct service to uh, what is transpiring on the streets. Um, it's a combination of safety, security, ambassadors, um, homeless outreach, really working in partnership with a whole host of the municipality, the service providers, and many cities like both of these and others are deploying um, a mixed uh, integrated team of professionals that are there to meet people uh, to serve their needs at their pace and really addressing uh, to a person the impacts that we know we have with either unhoused or those suffering from addictions and also providing that added sense of um, support to the community as a whole as a vis visible expression of uh, creating more um, a greater sense of, of, of safety security and engagement by the community. Ultimately, um, another short term um, act, uh, role for organizations in cities around the world, quite frankly, is really activating that public realm. We're seeing the shifts from daytime workforce to nighttime entertainment, but there's nothing more valuable and more important than how we look at activating our streets, creating that experience economy for visitors and residents alike. Uh, this is the work of downtown organizations to reach people people of all um, all levels throughout the day and evening, furry friends and all, right? Uh, you know, how are we addressing the visitors to places like Hamburg, as well as the workforce that are that is in the downtown, as we see here with tug of war type expressions during the day in Japan? You know, we know as downtown management organizations and place leaders that activating and leveraging the public realm is the strength of creating a vibrant and active uh, downtown environment, which has all that special uh, nature of experience where people can really um, you know, come as a visitor. If the, you're in the office, you're going to be able to uh, take advantage uh, of, of getting outside and participating in an experience in, in bringing your team together. Um, if you're a resident and you're needing that morning jog or that evening walk or dining on the sidewalks, this is all the dynamics of, of a vibrant urban center that downtown organizations and communities need to continue to uh, really propel forward, you know, the idea of parklets and taking advantage of the opportunity of how to best use our public space uh, to expand the experience is important. Or look for those spaces that are underutilized and where can we look at some innovation, um, in this case, taking uh, place in Cape Town, South Africa, or those alleyways and those laneways that are ripe for daytime and nighttime uh, activation, creating that something special and a purpose uh, for getting back to the downtown culture and arts and public gatherings that are sponsored to really embrace and bring people back into the city center. You know, how best you know to to leverage space you know provide that instagrammable moment that experience economy these are the continuing short-term work that's being done around the country uh, mural walks uh, have been a long-standing way of experiencing cities and investing in recreation opportunities for um, for the the youth in our cities this is the work that must continue to happen if we're going to continue to reactivate and recover post pandemic and then ultimately thinking about you know how are we creating that wonderful experience for for the, for the very young and the young at heart um, this is the beauty of the public realm and the work that needs to continue in the short term while we of course look to that long term redevelopment strategy which as noted is very much about urban uh, dense mixed use development first and foremost how are we going to accelerate residential um, population of our urban centers 
ultimately, I think, you know, going back to the very first no, uh, note about every city being unique, it's the fact that our citizens, no matter how hard we plan, will choose to use the cities as they want to use the cities. So I really uh, embrace this approach that's being taken in Louisville, engaging uh, people in a multitude of ways to begin to understand what is the possibility moving forward. Uh, because of course, you know, looking from uh, Jane Jacobs' perspective, you know, cities have that capability of providing for everyone, but it also means it needs to be created by everyone. And so, this forum and future forums and this discussion really lends itself well to learn from what's happening around the country. But ultimately, it's going to come down to the the leaders and the residents and the citizens and the visitors of Louisville that I think is going to ultimately make this successful. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a great kickoff to uh, the panel. Um, why don't we kick it over to Mallory now? Great. Thank you, David. Thanks, Barry. Uh, so uh, I am Mallory Batches. I'm the president of the Congress for the New Urbanism. And next slide, please. Uh, CNU, for folks who don't know, is a 2600 plus member. We're always growing. Uh, please check us out at cnu.org if you're interested in joining. We're a national uh, membership based national nonprofit organization full of a multidisciplinary cohort of practitioners that impact the built environment. So that's folks like planners and architects, it's transportation officials and engineers, it's civil engineers, it's developers, it's local advocates, community organizations, municipalities themselves are members. And we champion walkable, sustainable, equity supportive urbanism in cities, towns, and neighborhoods across the country. Next slide. Foundational to the work of our community of practice is the Charter of the New Urbanism. It's a set of 27 principles that inform our vision for the built environment. The charter was signed in 1996 and has been translated into 13 additional languages, but I like to reference it and share the first line of its preamble because I think it helps folks envision what CNU is working to repair in cities. The Congress for the New Urbanism views disinvestment in central cities, the spread of placeless sprawl, increasing separation by race and income, environmental deterioration, loss of agricultural lands and wilderness, and the erosion of society's built heritage as one interrelated community building challenge. Next slide. And as Barry said uh, in the introduction, CNU came to Louisville back in 2019 for our 27th annual Congress, our annual gathering. I was really privileged to have gotten to know the city then, both through the conference planning process, which was extensive, but also with the opportunity to participate in our legacy projects, which CNU delivers in the cities where we convene, connecting community partners that otherwise might not be able to resource a design project desperately needed with national firms able to provide pro bono design services. And so just to give you a little idea of what CNU has touched in Louisville in the past, we, you may be familiar with work that's gone on in these legacy projects, the East Portland neighborhood and pop-up interventions there, um, the neighborhood surrounding Woodlawn Avenue, I was actually on that design team, and some, some revitalization techniques for that area. Uh, the South Fork of Beargrass Creek, which was a project that I know has gained a lot of momentum since, uh, since CNU was in Louisville. And then, of course, along the 18th Street Corridor, uh, revitalization in that area of the city. So I was asked to talk about the pandemic and what we've learned and, and what CNU as an as a organization has learned broadly across the country. And I wanted to note that you know the pandemic brought people into the public realm of cities in ways that we hadn't anticipated before. It demonstrated all the more clearly that cities need people to thrive and they need drivers that bring people out of their homes and into public space, into the public realm. And when non-essential workers stopped coming into downtowns for work and as people stopped gathering inside restaurants and stores and theaters and meeting spaces, we had to look at what draws people to urbanism besides just proximity of activity. Tom Mahler is the um, director of strategy for the uh, downtown strategy for the city of Calgary, which was over 30% vacant when oil prices crashed at the start of the pandemic. So they were in a rough spot. And he said that Calgary focused on investments that made the city a place to live, not just come into for work and then retreat to a home elsewhere. 
They made investments like performing arts, open spaces, redeveloping streets to support greener environments that are more conducive to residential living. Next slide. So the challenge here. Um, the pandemic showed this challenge of the pressing need to reduce isolated single use activation. And I'm going to focus on three areas, empty office buildings, surplus of parking structures and parking spaces, and predominance of single family residential housing in cities. And the, the sort of key there is leaning on adaptability over predictability. So let's start with office buildings, looking at trends Brookings has, report, Brookings has reported that existing office space uses uh, use averages less than 50% across major US downtowns. <laughs> Vacancy rates are increasing, already 27% in San Francisco and 16% in New York. Downtowns are full of office space, but they have intricate ecosystems in those downtowns that might have relied on activities that people were doing at particular times of the day or particular needs because the primary use was office. So in a shift, this office-led activation is causing a broad shadow. And as we've talked a little bit earlier today, Louisville is feeling that. Many small businesses like restaurants and convenience services are struggling or closing due to lack of customers. Some urban transit systems are even buckling under ridership loss. There, uh, there are cities that are already exploring ways to respond. The city of Boston just announced a public-private partnership for office to residential conversion. That's a big topic of conversation. I'm sure we'll get into it in more detail. As this Brookings research here notes, conversions are only even feasible for some building floor plates. Not all buildings are conducive to shift from office to residential. And they're expensive to execute. And even in cities like Denver and San Francisco that are under severe housing shortages, the potential conversions only yield a small portion of needed housing. Downtowns are a tiny fraction of land in most US cities. And so we need to focus on adding new housing in all urban neighborhoods, not just downtown. Although downtown adding uh, residential is a key strategy that Louisville is talking about. It's both and, right? And the important point is that mixed use is not just better for struggling downtown retail and services that don't have enough office users, but it actually helps increase office demand as well. Next slide. Now let's think about parking, always robust conversation around parking. And the pandemic showed us there are a variety of ways we could use service parking in much different, better ways. The change in use and movement patterns in cities uh, that, that the pandemic prompted has shined a light on something CNU has been saying for decades. Most cities have far more parking than they actually need. So overtaking parking spaces and surface lots with things like outdoor dining space isn't the only way cities have chosen to adapt, although there are great examples of pop-ups across the country like this in this image. Many cities are using this surplus former parking to turn into housing especially cities at where the national uh, housing crisis is hitting strongest. But they're also turning these, uh, these excess parking spaces into things like parks in Dallas and Detroit, or even into restored wetlands in cities like San Diego. Next slide. Looking up at what our friends of the Parking Reform Network have in their growing database on downtown parking lots, I, I took a look at Louisville. You have a lot of land dedicated to parking in your downtown. Um, but to put this in perspective, you have you do have more parking percentage-wise than your neighbors of Cincinnati or Birmingham, Alabama, but you have less, significantly less than Tampa and Arlington, Texas. So you know if you want to pat yourselves on the back, you're you're making progress against some of your peers. Next slide. Finally, a trend that began before the COVID-19 pandemic but continues, I'm sure Lori will talk a little bit more about this after me, is how the housing crisis has aligned with many cities looking at zoning reform. And that's a topic I know is not new to Louisville your, with your land development code. Um, these processes are lengthy, politically fraught, um, but across the country, cities just like Louisville are taking on these battles to address the same challenges you're dealing with. As a national organization, CNU is focused on the context to this, which is that nearly four in 10 American households rent their home. 
Almost half of those folks are rent burdened, which means that spending more than 30% of your income on housing uh, qualifies you as rent burdened, and that more than 10 million renters spend half or more of their income on rent. So many of the regular and so many of the regular regulatory conditions that push this are born out of redlining, the racist and classist intentions to limit where poor minority persons could access housing in the first place historically. So let's flip that and think about the opportunities that the pandemic sort of daylighted for us. And, and I'm gonna focus on three here as well. Overall, there's a rapid desire to increase people-focused urban solutions across the country. And so three areas where we're seeing that is a focus on Vision Zero, an increase in alternative transportation mode adoption, and an attention to climate responsiveness, especially heat. And the way I describe that is prioritizing accessibility over exclusivity. So starting with vehicular movement, uh, walking in American cities has become much more dangerous over the last decade. Deaths are almost doubling in that period of time from vehicular pedestrian fatalities. Uh, there's a new Governor's Highway Safety Association report that found that pedestrian deaths are at a 40 plus year high. Transportation departments are taking a much closer look at why this is happening and instituting Vision Zero policies to attempt to reverse this deadly trend. The goal of a Vision Zero policy is to reduce the number of traffic fatalities on the street by 100% in the next decade. Big challenge, right? Yona Freemark at the Urban Institute cites a variety of compounding factors, including, as this slide shows, uh, vehicles built on much larger frames that are therefore significantly more deadly when they do strike a pedestrian. But even more important, next slide, is this challenge. Uh, in this challenge are street networks built for vehicular speed in the first place. This image is courtesy of my friend Chuck Marone at Strong Towns, who talks about the terrible so-called futon of transportation, a thoroughfare that neither creates a comp comprehensive urban environment of buildings, spaces, movement, and amenity that centers on the human experience, a street, nor does it create a high-speed vehicular connection between human-centered places, a road, but instead one that is da a dangerous combination of high speed highway design geometry with pedestrians, bikers, and turning traffic that are incredibly expensive to build and maintain and systematically undermine economic vitality of their surroundings as well. He refers to these as a strode. And as you look around Louisville, I'm sure you can think of a lot of intersections, even a lot of street of the street network, even in your downtown that would be described as a strode. Next slide. So reforming your street networks and eliminating strodes, enacting complete street policies to right-size existing streets and reducing pedestrian danger works hand in hand with the trend towards increasing adoption of alternative transportation modes. In 2022, the electric bike industry saw a significant boost in sales in the US. Cities like Washington DC, uh, over here on the right, are offering residents rebates of $750 to $1,500 for the purchase of qualifying bikes and investing a sig in significant expansion of protected bike lanes across the city in tandem. And although it's unique, some might say once in a lifetime event, uh, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour has offered something really interesting at each stop, a huge surge in public transit usage. Fans are taking trains and buses rather than driving or using Lyft or Uber to get to her shows. So much so that cities where these shows are happening are bolstering service and connections in order to respond to the demand. And I bring this up because it points out the value of connecting major activity hubs of which you have a number of those in downtown Louisville, like stadiums, concert arenas, whatever, with your transit system. Next slide. Finally, this week has shown us a trend that we can't ignore, which is the impacts of climate change. The current intensifying heat wave prompted the National Weather Service to issue heat alerts for 115 million people last Friday in 15 separate states. And I know Louisville is having better weather, weather today. I'm in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, by Friday, we're supposed to hit 100 degrees. So it's there's no let up in sight. Phoenix recorded uh, its 19th straight day over 110 degrees yesterday. We'll see what today brings. And 
there are many, many impacts that the changing climate is inundating cities with. This heat wave is just the latest example, but it offers a critical detail important to this challenge. Inequity is baked into the impact. Researchers have found that intra-urban heat islands are often linked to demographic factors like income and race. The EPA found that some communities in the United States, particularly those that are low income and with, a higher, with higher populations of people of color, have neighborhoods with higher temperatures relative to adjacent neighborhoods in the same city. With historic redlining, again, that, that discrimination, that regulatory discrimination based on race and class being a contributing factor. Specifically, people of color and community members with low incomes are more likely than other groups to live in historically redlined neighborhoods that are present day intra-urban heat islands. So when a heat wave like the current one engulfs cities across the country, it's having a disparate impact on historically marginalized communities. And what is a key tool for mitigating urban heat islands? Street trees. There on the right is Jones Street here in Savannah. And I can tell you, you can walk two blocks over that has significantly less street trees and you will feel the temperature change. And I'm sure you all are thinking of streets across Louisville that the same is true. So finally, to close up, putting these opportunities and these challenges together, the concept of a 15 minute city is a way of understanding urbanism that we've seen a trend at CNU spreading across the country and internationally. It can serve as a sort of Rosetta Stone of what we mean when we describe walkability and sustainability and equity. The places you need to go ought to be easily accessible from your home. You shouldn't have to drive long distances and sit in traffic to get where you live, uh, to get from where you live in work or shop, to take your children to school, to pick up your dry cleaning, to do all of your you know, various daily needs. In responding to the challenges posed by both the pandemic and climate change, cities around the world are adopting these policies. And one of the most aggressive efforts has been in Paris, where Mayor Anne Hidalgo effectively declared a war on cars in an effort to reduce their planet warming emissions. But this is not to say that the 15 minute city model is perfect. Policies supporting the approach need to make sure that its application works to reduce rather than expand existing disparity between invested and disinvested neighborhoods. But as a framework, I'm particularly drawn to the way it centers quality of life in informing urban patterns. Next slide. And I know that your Office of Advanced Planning and Sustainability has been working with MKSK using this as an approach to influence recommendations for Butchertown, Phoenix Hill, and Nulu. And I hope you're finding that it's helpful, a holistic way to approach the design and ongoing investment in your city. I'm personally interested to hear from Louisville more about how this approach is working in your city and what feedback you would have that I could bring to the broader CNU community. And that is going to be it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Appreciate your comments. I think people uh, who were at the Beyonce concert here Monday and <laughs> sat in their cars for two hours to get into the parking cool. lot would appreciate the uh, Pittsburgh example, uh, particularly uh, relevant this week. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Next is uh, Laurie from Zimmerman Volk Associates. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm delighted to be here. And I am really pleased to be with this group of people. Um, we've been doing downtown housing studies for 30 years. And at the beginning, there were very few people living downtown 30 years ago. And now when we get called for updates, the question that I'm asked over and over again are we starting all over again? Because the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on what's happened in downtowns and in cities in general. The issue of housing affordability and homelessness has now come to the fore in a way that it hasn't in decades. High office vacancies are making the situation even worse. Downtowns appear to be empty, and where are all the people that used to be walking around? And of course, retail has a terrible time surviving without customers. If you don't have customers, you will go out of business. And that's what we are seeing in so many cities across the country. Housing affordability is not something that has just happened recently. You can see from this chart that it's a housing affordability issues have been getting worse and worse over time. Each little time that 
chart drops at the time of a housing crash or a housing recession. And where we are now is showing the widest gap between what the median household income is in the cities and in the country and what the average home values are. So, so many people can't afford to buy houses today. And that housing affordability issue keeps climbing up the income brackets. What we first thought of as missing middle was not housing types, but the missing middle of income. About 20 years ago, I noticed that incomes usually should sort out with the fewest number of people at the top with the most money and the most number of people at the bottom with the least amount of money. That's the way cities have been structured economically, <clears throat> excuse me, for a long time. However, about 10 years ago, I noticed that when I looked at the uh, sorting out of incomes in a city, the pyramid had become an hourglass. And the middle income households were either falling to the bottom, not making any gains at all, and a few lucky ones were soaring up to the top. But that's meant that the middle, the middle of the housing grouping has practically disappeared in many cities. Missing middle housing types are also housing types that we used to build all the time, but have given up in favor of large scale developments. And maybe not so much in downtowns, but in those edge neighborhoods that surround downtowns, infill buildings that are made up of middle missing housing types would be much more effective way of adding housing than to try to build 250 unit apartment buildings, which will only upset the neighborhood. Missing middle housing types are those neighborhood scale buildings that have multiple units, but range in size from a duplex uh, up to live work housing units. We have found that cities that have been using the missing middle housing model have been able to create much more affordable housing for those people who could no longer really enter the ownership housing market. And it's become an important component of many cities across the United States. Uh, certainly the National Choice Neighborhood Program has been responsible for providing more affordable and missing middle housing types in cities across the country. This is the Armstrong Renaissance in Richmond, Virginia. And as you can see, there are a variety of different building types which range from single family detached houses to small scale uh, apartment buildings. The photograph on the upper right is of all the rental housing and the photograph on the lower left, <clears throat> excuse me, is ownership housing. And you can see that if you were driving along that street, you would not know which building was ownership, which building was rental, and whether the occupants were poor or rich. And that's one of the goals of using these kinds of housing types to redevelop public housing or to infill in de devastated neighborhoods. Mansion apartment buildings are also a building type that is now starting to be, be built across the country. On the left, you see Kansas City, Missouri, uh, which is a city that has multiple numbers of buildings of this type, six unit apartment buildings where everyone has their own little porch and a center lobby entry. On the right is a new mansion building built in Providence, Rhode Island, in a neighborhood that adjoins downtown Providence. And as I said, these have become a much more effective way of providing rental housing units that are more acceptable to people who live in the neighborhood than a large scale rental apartment building. Upper floor housing has become a key component of providing both affordable and market rate housing units in cities that don't have the capacity to even accommodate a 250 unit rental apartment project. We've been doing multiple studies in small towns and cities across the state of Indiana. And one issue that has been confronting these cities is that in that market, uh, there have been extreme growth in manufacturing jobs. 
However, the growth in manufacturing jobs has outstripped the number of housing units available for those people to live in. And at the time we did the study, there were 6,000 manufacturing jobs going vacant because there was an extreme lack of both affordable as well as market rate housing. And we proposed that the regional entities provide an upper floor housing program that would help these small building owners understand what needed to be done to convert those apart those units on the upper floors into housing instead of what so many of them were being used for was storage or just being left vacant. Uh, the initial results from this program have been very positive and there have been three small towns in Indiana that have been uh, using the program to convert some of the office, the, these buildings in the downtown to housing. The additional bonus of providing housing is it also adds people on the street, providing more vitality and support for the retail in those small towns. Raleigh, North Carolina underwent a, a, a huge program of reevaluating their zoning in order to provide a, a greater variety of, of uh, building types. As Mallory mentioned, uh, today's market is much more responsive to smaller buildings. And so many neighborhoods in cities across the country have been zoned single family only. So the first issue is really seeing what kind of zoning is permitted and whether you can actually infill with something other than a detached house. Well, they did that in Raleigh and several of the edge neighborhoods to downtown have been filled, the vacant lots have been filled with a charming variety of row houses and duplexes and townhouses and detached houses. So there is a building type to correspond to a variety of different potential owners and renters in Raleigh. We were discussing earlier the fact that even in downtowns that have had a lot of housing built, what's important to a good percentage of the housing market is new construction because those buildings are actually able to provide unit and housing types that aren't available in the downtown. This building is called Reverb and this one is located in Kansas City, Missouri, but it is and it has been built in a number of different cities across the country. One reason for its appeal is it's semi-modular, and you can move the module, modules around to create either small studios or large three-bedroom apartments. They also provide uh, a lot of, of technical advances so that occupants can use their cell phones for practically everything. And that has a great deal of appeal to today's technology oriented young people. Uh, new construction in this case was in San Diego, California. And again, it is taking advantage of the urban view, which a lot of people don't understand that for many, many people who have moved downtown and who want to move to a downtown, being able to look out and see the actual physical infrastructure of the city is as important as the unit itself. And so these glass wall buildings have a great deal of appeal for a good percentage of the market and is, are especially important in cities and downtowns that have had very little new residential construction. Housing preferences do change over time. So it's important to keep providing different kinds of housing to keep up with today's 21st century housing market. In terms of high office vacancy, as Mallory noted, the national median office occupancy rate is now 50%. That means half the office spaces across the country no longer have anyone in them, and that's had a devastating effect. The new live work is now employees choosing to live at home and work at home and refusing to turn to the office. How this shakes out over the next 10 years is still really un, uh, not able to be determined because a lot of the current people who are working from home 
would really prefer to be back at the office. They just don't want to be in the same office situation that they were before. However, in terms of those empty office buildings, housing is economic development. The number of B and C office building conversions that have taken place in downtown Buffalo is quite impressive. Uh, about 15 years ago, when we did our first downtown study, the city had acquired an older building, an older office building, and converted it to affordable housing for young people. At the time, it was rather controversial because initially everyone's always afraid of affordable housing, particularly when the affordability situation wasn't as dire as it is today. However, they went ahead with it and that became a very attractive place for young people who are just starting out on their jobs to live. But BNC office conversion was later than an emphasis of a study we did on behalf of the Buffalo Niagara Partnership who wanted to know if they were able to convert enough of those nearly vacant BNC buildings, would they be able to then lower the vacancy rate to the point where they could support a construction of a new 21st century office building? And that is what happened. And so it was quite a positive experience for them to understand that this is a source, empty office buildings are a source of housing in a city that may not have a lot of land uh, in which to build new. Uh, downtown Detroit was particularly impressive in their conversion of historic office buildings. Uh, many years ago, when we did a downtown study, the head of the downtown organization had targeted 12 of their historic office buildings, all vacant, some with trees growing out of the roof, uh, for redevelopment into housing. However, there were no builders at all interested. So she raised a $20 million loan fund in order to, to actually be able to provide low interest loans to developers who would take these buildings on to convert them to housing. And that took about 15 years for the last building to convert it, be converted but it happened about five years ago. So those 12 white elephants, as Kate called them, are now an active vital part of downtown Detroit. And this was all pre-Dan Gilbert, who many of you may know, came and bought another 90 buildings in the downtown and has been converting them to housing and commercial and mixed uses that correspond to the housing preferences of the downtown market in Detroit. Uh, Live Work Now, which once was only uh, a housing type proffered by new urbanists, members of the CNU, and wasn't very successful in so many places across the country. However, now that so many people want to live and work in the same unit, new construction of Live Work space has become a large component of edges of downtowns in many cities across the United States. This building is uh, in Minneapolis. And as you can see, it has a designated space in front, which actually goes into the back where retail or office could be uh, utilized or the owner of that unit could use for their own workspace. In the past, we found that live work units were typically bought by an individual who would then either lease out the workspace and lease out the office space or buy it and live in the entire unit. Now, these units are actually being used by the same resident as both office and work. So we're seeing a, a huge boom in live work construction across the cities in the United States. Now, empty retail spaces, which are happening even in Manhattan, uh, are occurring because the diminishing supply of office workers is simply not sufficient to keep all those businesses going. Downtown housing provides major support, though, for retail and restaurants. Some of our first downtown studies were done at the behest of the downtown business districts who said, we can't support 
our restaurants, our sharp, our shops on the nine to five business alone. We need people living and working and sleeping and playing in downtown 24 hours a day. And more downtown housing obviously means more customers on the street. That means that downtown housing has become more and more important as uh, the economic driver of what's going to be happening in downtown, certainly over the next three to five years. Housing is now the economic engine, not office and not retail, but housing is the economic engine for downtowns and cities across the country. And not to lose sight of that, the environment in which those housing units are to be built needs to be one that's supportive of what people who live in a neighborhood want to see. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Appreciate that. That was a really nice uh, overview of the uh, housing options that uh, maybe have not been considered as much in and around downtown Louisville that we're starting to look at uh, for all the reasons you just mentioned. Our last speaker is James Lima. James, uh, you're our you're our cleanup hitter. It's a daunting task given all that we've just heard, which was remarkable, and I'm mindful of the information overload, so I'll try to be relatively brief. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this important conversation. I'm going to take a slightly different tack, although I think I'm mostly kind of reaffirming what what the prior speakers have have all said, which is that we're all very hopeful about the the future of center cities, um, but it's going to take a lot of coordinated partnership and collaboration uh, to work in lockstep and to have both a, a clear vision for the future and the the broader leadership across a horizontal networked governance model. Uh, so I'm James Lima. I'm the head of James Lima Planning and Development with real estate and economic advisors working around uh, mostly cities in North America. I'll talk a little bit about um, what we call um, the economics of placemaking and, and talk in terms of, of the economic imperative, next slide, of, of investing in place. Uh, a quick note on placemaking, next slide. You know, it's worth just taking a minute to recognize, next slide, that it's really about, cult I'm sorry, back one, about cultivating this connection between people and the physical space around us, fostering connection between people and the space and situating the space within uh, systems. And we work a lot in uh, with systems and usually at a district scale. And I think that's such a great opportunity in thinking about center cities, uh, the infrastructural systems, financial systems, zoning systems, uh, cultural and, and social systems, uh, those that need repair, but those that really can reinforce other parts of these interrelated layering of systems. Next slide. But why is the individual and collective experience of place so important to the work that we're all doing? Um, in a way, each one of you is an expert in place and the value of place. Um, because you know from from your your own experience in center cities what makes you come back again and again to the places you value and so we need to be thinking about that kind of human response uh, and the fact that coming out of this pandemic everyone everywhere has never had more choices about where to be and so the competition for people uh, for their foot traffic, their spending, their vibrancy, their creative talent um, has never been a, a greater uh, competitive landscape. Next slide. So part of thinking about repair to downtowns and revitalization can be overwhelming because you think my district is big and a lot of it is daunting and it can feel overwhelming that we have to fix it all. And uh, the reality is, is we can't fix it all. And the great news is that we actually don't have to fix it all. 
Um, I focus a lot in the work we do in cities um, on what I call loops. And again, each of you has in your own mind a whole bunch of loops that you like to take in your favorite cities, right? Because you've, you've done it any number of times and there are a number of rewards along the way that make you say, I love that street, there's great culture, there's food, there's people watching, there's recreation, there's a vista, there's a sense of connection, there's an architectural interest, there's beautiful landscape, there's shade, there's mobility options that make it easier for me. I feel more connected and in community um, when I do those loops. So the challenge really is to focus on what, what are those systems in your place, those loops, and do an audit of the number of rewards, those, those beneficial experiences that, that you know, provide you with joy and delight um, along those routes. And that becomes an economic development strategy. That becomes like urban planning, place making, but it's, it really in many ways is foundational to which places are gonna compete in an increasingly complicated landscape for our attention. Because again, we've never had more choices. And I refer to urban perches. And I just think even if we're alone in cities, we can feel connected by stopping and, and having this kind of uh, connection. Um, and the, the encouraging thing, especially in some of the work I just saw that Lori shared is we're increasingly creating product, especially housing product that has more of a flow between indoor and outdoor living, which is such a frustration in so much of what we've seen in the past. Like our, our building systems, our, our architectural imperatives, what the market is demanding is much more of an indoor outdoor lifestyle. And that's great for cities because it makes us much more connected and really enlivens uh, the public realm. Next. Next slide. So I talk a lot about the fact that um, the economic imperative starts with the fact that capital and investment is following people. It's no longer the case, right? That, that the CEO of a major company decides where the company is gonna go. We're all saying, all right, where, where am I most likely to have the best chance of attracting and retaining the best talent uh, in service to my business, my university, my sports team, my, my organization? Um, and, and it really focuses around that experience of place. Um, and place is something that's a, a living, breathing thing and needs constant investment. It also needs nurturing. And we're gonna talk about like the role of uh, stewardship and governance and how important place management organizations and downtown district managers are really the unsung heroes of, of, of both this long-term downtown revitalization that's been decades in the making and, and an increasingly important part of our recovery post pandemic. Next slide. One of the ways uh, to think about building uh, political coalitions uh, for funding um, and trying to get organizations aligned uh, around a clear shared vision um, is to think about the economic consequences of, of not being relevant. Um, and so in the same way that we have all these choices, we've got to think about our places um, in a competitive marketplace. So, you know, ask yourself the question, what are you selling in your downtown district? And what are the increasingly broad markets buying? And are you competing? And focus there too. Um, this is, a, a again, a, a never been more competitive marketplace. Next slide. Um, it's also, a, it's just a fantastic moment to repair things that quite frankly, weren't so great about this monolithic idea of like the central business district. Like you will work here and then you'll get in your car, your transit, and you will live here and you will, you know, have leisure over here. I was kind of this stale notion. Um, we would have preferred to not have the kind of disruption uh, process to get us here, but here we are. Um, so uh, enter this idea of the central social distance, which is to be clear, very much about sustaining and growing business 
in these economic, social, and cultural hubs that, in my view, will always outperform uh, outlying areas that you know have become important secondary tertiary nodes for economic activity as we have more connectivity through technology. However, think about our public realm and a most compelling and delightful public realm as kind of the overarching goal. And that if we get that right, then business and the workers who sustain business will seek out that most compelling public realm as the place to be a lot of the time, if not all of the time. Downtown investors in housing and renters and uh, buyers of real estate will seek out these pride of place moments that, as everyone's been saying, you know, will be about the farmers markets and the places of connection and the and new kinds of amenities. Uh, these things all take work. And so there are layers of it. And so there are components that we see and they're a long list, but I'll just highlight a few. Um, it's been said again and again, housing, housing, housing. Next slide. Uh, absolutely thinking about um, building the political coalition and constituency for investments that will support conversion of outdated office buildings to residential. We had such pleasure working with Tom Mahler um, in Calgary. Uh, Mallory, you were talking about Calgary's uh, plan. And when we started talking about office to resi conversion, um, it was pre-pandemic and it was gaining traction uh, mostly because they had a 30% vacancy rate as a kind of boom and bust energy town. Uh, but it really took the pandemic to, to send you know, both the provincial and local leadership to say, we've our backs against the wall, we've got to do something. Boston just, you know, enacted a, a very um, favorable um, set of incentives for conversion. You change the assessment from office to residential and 75% of that, that value is, is uh, forgiven for 29 years. It's a very rich uh, incentive to to motivate those kinds of conversions. So thinking about um, product types and 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 different price points, and you know, again, this is also requires political constituencies to go to the state, the county, the city housing finance authorities. That you know, without constant political pressure um, and coalitions, you know, will be under resourced. So it's, it really does take these kinds of coalitions across those networked governance models uh, to continue to beat the drum to say, in your upcoming funding cycle, we've got to find a way to create more bonding authority, more tax credit allocations and the like. It's 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 a constant. Um, experiential retail, I think it's been talked about quite a bit, but um, we see just more and more uh, creating daytime downtown activities that are family friendly, that are really enhancing the, the cultural and social elements of downtowns and for work that we're doing now in in a sort of major downtown in, in in Florida, really focus on daytime culture and kind of family activation. Next slide. Really had to focus on the last three, which is like arts and culture, formal and informal. Um, the a, a compelling public realm, uh, arts and uh, parks and open space, um, and then the the economic competitiveness of embracing diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, um, and the, the role that all these play and how interrelated they are. Next. This all seems like the soft side of economic development, but in my experience, these are actually some of the most uh, compelling competitive advantages that, that drive talent to choose places in an innovation economy and a growing knowledge economy. I believe that innovation economies are sustained by cultural infrastructure. And we just have to look at the top cities around the country that are attracting the talent that are being, uh, you know, the, the uh, that are winning the, the competition for companies investing in, in tech and R&D. Next slide. In our work in downtown Columbus, Indiana, which has this spectacular collection of post-war uh, architecture. Um, it's really about using a public realm strategy to better connect assets to each other. Uh, it was really and is underperforming as a downtown district, but we're really leveraging both their imprimatur as a architectural hub and an arts hub, a creative hub, but also the fact that they're a downtown river city 
that has very little relationship between its river and its downtown? And how do we use great public realm strategies as connectors so that we create these one plus one equals three moments uh, through investments in mobility, infrastructure, great streets and parks? Thanks. Um, in a city in, in Florida where we just finished a master plan, um, this is, believe it or not, one of the most consequential locations between the civic center and the cultural hub. And the first comments we got was, oh, we can't possibly fix this because so-and-so owns that parking garage and the rail line runs to the left and they'll never say yes. And we we're like, this is your high line. This could be a greenway that runs right up the center of downtown. And next slide, please. And if we just got the owner to say, but what if your nighttime economy centered around kind of family visitation, arts and culture, the fringe festival that's co-located nearby, that this combination of lush landscape and lighting and public art, not, not by the business improvement district alone, not by the city alone, but by a collaboration of everybody who's already doing talented, amazing things together um, and sees the economic value of unlocking this potential. Again, this was, a, I think, a one plus one equals eight moment. <laughs> Next slide. And then just making sure that we're also nurturing the informal arts. And this was a, a key point in, in Florida, too. They had made enormous investments in formal art and culture. But it's the informal ecosystems of investing and nurturing um, not-for-profit organizations that are supporting individual artists of like kooky basement poetry slam spaces and live music spaces, like just the funky, the weird, the 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 resources available to to nurture a creative community and economy that is such a magnet for people young and old. And but really thinking about what that can be and the role that uh, place management organizations play in that. Next. I would encourage everybody to, to take a look at the case for open space, which is a, a report that I co-authored with my colleagues at the Urban Land Institute. Uh, it's both relevant to the economic value of parks and open space um, in the broader economic context uh, and in real estate context, but is also relevant to, to the role of great streets in the kind of public realm conversation. Everything from greater equity to economic benefit, recreation to your economic competitiveness to attract talent. And this interrelationship of those kinds of investments, um, we often find that a conservative city council thinks, well, that's just nice to have. We can't afford that right now. And you know, we make the case, the economic argument, the economic benefits analysis, to say, actually, you know, you can choose to not compete, uh, but it's at your own peril. Like your your peer cities are all doing this. And if you want to be in the game, if you want to be in that competitive landscape. Um, these are the things you need to do in that way. It's sort of a kind of a subversive way of doing the right thing, right? Uh, but yeah, clearly we can make the case for economic output, job creation and the like, but so many social and, and cultural and economic benefits. Next slide. Uh, one example, uh, a relatively simple trail network that runs through downtown Indianapolis. You know, it's a simple bike and pedestrian uh, investment. Um, it is so beloved, but it also had an enormous, enormous impact on real estate values. Um, in the time that the product was announced, uh, between 2008 and 2014, assessed values of properties that were proximate to the trail rose 148%. There's an enormous opportunity to invest in public realm improvements, parks, trails, open spaces. And create enormous new real estate value of things that are within 600 to 1,000 feet are radiating this value premium. Uh, let's not do that just for the sake of creating economic value, but to create economic structures to capture some of that value through district mechanisms, specifically to redirect some of that captured value for the things that one, government isn't really funded to otherwise do, might want to do, but can't, and that the private sector on its own isn't doing. So uh, one example, next slide, is you know addressing what are really sort of the unintended negative consequences of successful economic development initiatives and successful investments in parks and open space. Uh, there are 
plenty of examples all over the country, unfortunately, that um, we're successful in spurring market demand to be near great parks, to be near a trail, to be near a revitalized downtown. And if we look at social vulnerability indices, if we look at um, historic inequities, but the vulnerable renter populations, uh, which tend to be predominantly uh, people of color, uh, we can have unintended negative effects. So we've got to do some hard work, which cannot happen without collaboration across public and private and philanthropic and civic sectors, which is as much holistic planning to say, what are my affordable housing preservation strategies to keep people in place? And there's so many programs, so many not-for-profits, so many great case studies on the possibilities of that. And then what is my affordable housing production plan to try to keep up with the demand to the extent that this is gonna to continue to create market pressure in the larger districts. Next slide. For our work in downtown Austin, Texas, um, and East Austin, we looked at a couple of areas of social vulnerability because our cap and stitch project we're doing to deck over the I-35 highway that separates historically African-American neighborhood of East Austin from downtown will undoubtedly create enormous new real estate value and market demand. Um, East Austin's been under a decade or more of severe market pressure, and there's been a lot of displacement already. However, there's still a substantial amount of legacy businesses in those areas that we mapped and plotted and identified some of the small business best practices and programs to help support the retention and, and services for those, but also to help create new ones. We mapped the housing uh, affordability production in Austin, and we're surprised to see that in some of the areas that had the highest need had had almost no affordable housing production. So just flagging that as a policy matter to use the data-driven analysis to say, look, before we go too far, let's all agree, again, across sectors, that there's an opportunity and, a, and an imperative to address some of the social vulnerability. Next slide. Uh, one case study is a, a great project. Um, oh, sorry, back one, please. Um, in in Chattanooga, um, a kitchen incubator um, initiated by a not-for-profit called Launch that focuses on empowering underrepresented entrepreneurship. You know, the, this has great social benefits to create career pathways, but also to involve local residents and to address inequities, but also as a way to deal with, you know, really uh, uh, compounding uh, workforce challenges where we have um, a significant lack of, 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 of workforce readiness in a bunch of uh, growing sectors, including uh, tourism and hospitality. So, you know, just the, the result in all of this is to kind of think about uh, parallel investments in, um, next slide, in like investing in place, uh, in real estate, a mix of uses, and investing in people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and to really, uh, invest in people in a way that's addressing historic inequities. Um, I think the result's gonna be center cities that outperform their peers, that create enormous value and vibrancy and continue to be places of choice and opportunity for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, James. James. Really appreciated that. And uh, I think all of the panelists have given us a really good overview of the challenges and the opportunities that are facing us, uh, not just uh, currently, but over the next decade in terms of how uh, how downtown is repositioned to uh, compete both locally and nationally. Uh, we were supposed to end at two. Uh, I think we're going to keep going. We want to open it up to uh, questions uh, or comments people have. If you do have that, uh, any, any question, please put it in the chat and we'll try to get it on. We want to also encourage uh, the speakers to uh, comment or observe uh, uh, on what others have said. Uh, we think that would be useful. I have two uh, comments, questions I want to throw out initially, and uh, if people want to respond to that is great. The first one really relates to uh, the last few slides that James uh, presented, which was a great summary about the uh, the uh, package of, uh, of what we offer in terms of downtown to people that we want to come live and work and play in downtown. 
some of you may have read the article in the Times last week or a couple of weeks ago about the uh, uh, depends where you live, but either the challenges, the opportunities of a lot of people who can't work remotely now choosing to not live in New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, but locate in other cities that are more either family friendly or affordable or for whatever reasons offer a different package. And a city like Louisville is, I think, well positioned for that. But in the past, uh, people who live downtown, one of the primary uh, uh, values to that would be you walk to work. And if you're working remotely and we want those people to come to Louisville and live downtown, we need to offer exactly the kind of environment that James laid out. It's not about where you are in relationship to your office. It's what what neighborhood services, what kind of place is exciting to be when you can live anywhere. So that's a challenge, an opportunity for us, I think we need to think about in terms of the value of some of, I, th I think James was tactful in saying some city councils think these are soft, soft elements. We sometimes say they think of them as fluffy elements <laughs> as opposed to economic development drivers. So I'd like you uh, to comment on that. The, the question I have is, uh, we all know that a focus on residential and uh, those those softer items that James mentioned is really critical right now. Uh, do we run the risk though of alienating the office workers or businesses that are downtown or we want them to stay downtown? And uh, is there a, a, a risk that perhaps they're thinking that they're not as valuable to downtown because of these changes. I know we don't think that because we know that a strong mix has to include office workers. But uh, in terms of how these discussions are occurring, should we be careful not to uh, not to overlook that segment of the downtown? Uh, it may not be as important as it was five years ago, but it certainly uh, remains to be an important part of a strong mixed use downtown. So if you want to comment on those or any other other well, comments that you heard today, I, please. I will, uh, I, I, only, I will only just say that you know, obviously you have to keep the business support services, the FedEx Kinkos and that sort of thing. But it turns out office offices are made up of human beings, too, who actually want the same thing. Uh, and so they're all looking for like, like, is it going to be worth it for me to come into the office? And am I going to see my friends? And can we go somewhere interesting for lunch and walk in a park? Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna. I was gonna leverage. You know, Mallory said it, it's a yes and, and you know, when we look at workforce studies and moving forward, um, it's really about the workplace ecosystem, which is not just the office. It's often the home, but this is where third places, as a general term, becomes so enormously important. It is the parks. It is the coffee shops. It is the restaurants. So this live, work, play ecosystem that is becoming um, uh, really a, a driver for location decisions made by especially the, the, the knowledge economy worker is all about place. And so these are the conversations that have to occur about open space, public space, community spaces. Uh, you know, if, if you've got a location that has extraordinarily fast internet and coffee, people will find it. <laughs> yeah, I would also like to reiterate that so many of our downtown studies were commissioned by downtown business districts who really felt that they couldn't survive just on the nine to five worker market. Um, and I don't believe that if there is a greater focus on housing in business districts that have been primarily commercial up to this point, that they're going to feel left out. I actually think that it will help them to, uh, especially building owners, uh, to reduce that vacancy rate, which will make the downtown feel less unsuccessful. You know, if your if your vacancy rate goes from seventy five to ninety percent because you have taken some buildings off the market and converted them to housing, you not only get more people downtown, but you also look a lot better from the commercial perspective. Well, and I would also add that the 
the idea of mixed use of, of areas of your city being mixed use that goes in multiple directions. There's, you know, the, the residential or primarily residential neighborhoods that we have as business changes as technology and arts and creative and all kinds of other industries are finding, you know, desirable living condition relative to work. Some of those smaller entities are going into neighborhoods and finding opportunities to become the, the commercial or business mixed use of an otherwise residential neighborhood in the same way that drawing residential into a downtown is a way to complexify the, the uses in that area of the city. I just want to thank everybody. We are uh, three minutes over and before we lose everybody off the call, I want to make sure that we are going to try to get some of these questions answered. Some of them are really good. Um, Barry and I will work with the panelists on that as well as um, share some of the the links that were the shared in the chat as well. I will be sending out a recording of this entire conversation to everybody just in case you want to watch it uh, and dig into some things, but we will be sending out a recap um, and some probably to do items that come out of this uh, panel for our downtown strategy and for uh, Louisville Downtown Partnership.